Aloha Aina, and welcome to Voices of Truth, one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future, brought to you by the Kawani Foundation. I'm Ehuke Kahu Cardwell, and here we are today in the Kapuhulu area of Oahu. Well, we have a very special show in store for you today, because our guest is Kanalo Young. That is Dr. Kanalo Young, Ph.D. You see, Kanalo teaches history up at Kamakakuo Kalani. That's the Center for Hawaiian Studies at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, here on Oahu. But Kanalo doesn't just teach history. He's also in charge of the master's program at the Center for Hawaiian Studies. But get this, Kanalo is a native Hawaiian quadriplegic. That's right. For the last nine months, Kanalo has been under doctor's orders, bedridden, convalescing in his bed, at home, right up the street from where we are now. And I want to tell you, that hasn't stopped Kanalo at all. You see, Kanalo has turned his bedroom into his office. And as you're about to find out, people from all over the world have come into Kanalo's bedroom to meet with him and do business. So, if you're curious about what this is all about, come on along and join us as we visit today with Hawaii Superman, Dr. Kanalo Young. So, Kanalo, aloha. Welcome to Voices of Truth. Thank you. It's great to have you on the show. My pleasure. Wonderful. It's great to be here with you. As I mentioned to our viewers, explain to our viewers outside of your house in front, you're working from bed these days, aren't you? I am. And it seems as though the world is coming to this bedroom right here. It's pretty amazing. It is, isn't it? You never really figure for some of the most significant things in, in your life to to unfold the way they do. Yes. So would you, if you would please, explain to our viewers why this is your office. This well, is your desk. Yeah, this is your, yeah. <laughs> this is the, the work area, the yeah. meeting area, everything right now. Exactly. I uh, have been a spinal cord injured quadriplegic for 35 years now. And wow. Counting. I uh, was injured, as probably a lot of your viewers don't know, at the age of 15 while swimming with my friends at Cromwell's place called Shangri-La, mm. where Doris Duke's mansion is at Black Point. Oh, no kidding. At on this Doris island. Duke Cromwell, yeah. Yeah, on the island of Oahu here where yeah. we live. Yeah. Doris Duke Cromwell, the tobacco heiress, deeded a little swimming cove below her mansion, her estate, mm -hmm. to the city and county of Honolulu. Mm -hmm. And for the boys in the area, Palolo, Kapuhulu, Mo'ili'ili, Kapuhiki, it was a getaway of sorts. And I got away one day on August 14th, 1969 with my friends from Pucky Park. Mm -hmm. And we went to cool off and swim. And I guess I was exasperated about a lot of things that day, but one of the things I didn't think about was the depth of the water mm -hmm. and being careful. Mm -hmm. And I did a deep water dive into about four feet of water. Ooh. The spinal cord injury resulted in the paralysis that resulted in coping with a disability into adulthood and had pretty good handle on it as a younger man. Mm -hmm. But as anybody in the baby boomer generation knows now, as we age, we have to adjust and learn how to cope all over again. Yes. So that's what this is all about. If anybody heard recently, the last maybe six, eight months, about Christopher Reeve's demise. Christopher Reeve who played Superman uh, in the movies mm -hmm. was a different kind of Superman after he had to cope with his spinal cord injury. And pressure wounds got the best of him in some respects and started to weaken him. And that's what I'm dealing with, these pressure wounds that, that require bed rest as a prescription for getting better. So Christopher Reeves, the irony, Canalo, is that Christopher Reeves turned out to be not Superman in the movies, but Superman for real in real life. Yes, that's right. Yes, he did. And he uh, transcended his physical circumstances and used his public notoriety and, and, and attention getting for a very positive purpose, which is the curing of spinal cord mm -hmm. injury paralysis. Mm -hmm. I, on the other hand, had to take a different path because in 1969, they weren't talking cure. Mm -hmm. They were talking cope. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to become a champion at coping mm -hmm. and realized uh, in the course of that, we can't do it alone. Mm. 
and that brought me into conflict between a, a very American way to look at a rugged individualism way yep. to look at disability yes. versus a more Native Hawaiian way to look at disability. Good, and, and let's talk a little bit about that. So explain the difference between the two, especially what it means coping as a Native Hawaiian. Huh? Well, I think the thing that I've learned more than anything else is that Kuleana is forever. And what does Kuleana mean? The province of responsibility that is the obligation of privilege and the privilege of obligation all rolled up in one. So one's area of responsibility. Yes, and it's a cycle. Yes. It's not on linear time and it's not in reconfigured human space. It's, it's in a cycle of time like the seasons between our rainy season and our, our warm season. And in that cycle of seasons comes an awareness that with every season change comes maybe a slightly different kuleana, but it is eternal. It's interesting because in you know Western concepts, when you talk about my area of responsibility or somebody else's, normally we think of a physical place or a physical thing. Like I'm responsible for taking care of my bicycle or my car or my house or my clothes. But what you're talking about is something completely different, yes? Yes. It takes on physical manifestations, but that's not the root of what kuleana means. Ah. Kuleana is the internal aina, the spiritual physical space. The When something that you, like I was talking to you earlier about Waikiki, which is the ocean of my, my boyhood, it's, 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 an, it's an internal kuleana to make sure that I do things that keep Waikiki maintained well. Right whether from here. Bed, whether I'm yeah. in my bed, yeah. Yeah. whether I'm out there asking the kids up on the wall, who talk a good line about Malama Aina, but they forget uncle's going to tell them to pick up the rubbish yeah. that they just left from the fast food joint yes. when they had lunch. So it's a matter of one generation helping, not ordering, but helping another generation up and down, below us and above us, to fulfill the collective kuleana. That's wonderful. So just so our viewers know, we're just a stone's throw away from Waikiki right now. If we were to go outside with the camera, we could see Diamond Head. And Malama Aina means to take care of the land. That's right. Yes. That's right. And so what you're saying is that you're taking care of Waikiki, whether you're out there in Waikiki or right here in your bed. That, that's Kuleana. You're taking care of biz right, right here. That's Wonderful. Right. Because there are still many things I can do and many skills I can use to, to better the conditions of others and be of service to other people. Mm -hmm which is a big part of Kuleana. It's my friend and I, we like to, to joke, and, you know, she does a good job taking care of me. And, and when I think about my friend Lois, what I really think about is the joke that goes back and forth. And she likes to say, well, it's not about you. you know, mm -hmm. It's about me. <laughs> and, 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 and I like to say the same thing back. But that's that cycle I'm talking about uh. is that at any given time, we can even be humorous and funny about knowing that it really isn't about us. So if we're self-deprecating, and if we can get outside of our own box that says, ah, poor me, or, oh, feel sorry for me, or, or dig the angry me, or dig the evil me, and say, none of that really matters as much as mala ma'ina, mala ma'ohana, take care of the family, take care of the land, take care of each other, and be good to yourself but not at the expense of the bigger picture. Wow, amazing. You're the type of person that uh, strikes me as somebody who spends no time at all in that place called poor me. No, I would, I would correct you. Okay. I do spend time there. How much? Uh, just enough to realize that it was one minute too long <laughs> and I gotta get back on the stick. Good for you. Yeah, but it's there. Good for you. Because part of the American individualism of dealing with disability is wipe it out, it doesn't exist. Ah. And what I've learned about the Kanaka Maoli way is that we are everything we are, including me being very angry sometimes, yeah. needlessly, but it's out. And once it's out, it's out. Very, very sad sometimes, but once it's out, it's out. Mm -hmm. If that's my overall climate, if that's become the replacement for my kuleana, well, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But if I have a bad afternoon, I'm going to allow myself that bad, rotten, lousy afternoon knowing that, yeah. okay, that's it. Back to it now.
Yeah, very good. Canalo, you're Dr. Canalo Young, Ph.D. Mm -hmm. You're a very accomplished individual. Why don't you share with our audience what your Ph.D. is in and what you do for a living? Well, I don't think I would have ever gotten to college except for maybe three factors. Number one, my family, my parents, George and Gwen Young, my, my immediate family, my nephews and my brother, my sister, and then the extended family. Because they gave me, literally, I guess you call it the wind beneath my wings, when I had no wind and no wings. Mm. I went into the university system two different times. Mm -hmm. And the last degree I got was a PhD in history, which helped me see the world in a much more broad-based way. Mm. And then I was fortunate enough to get a job at Hawaiian Studies as I finished the PhD program. That was 14 years ago. Mm. And... Um, I think what's most rewarding is I realized that in a way the Hawaiian community in 1989-1990 was in a sense historically and culturally challenged. Yes. Spiritually disabled. Yes. Yes. Broken in many ways but in recovery. And I think since 1970 or so that indigenous rights movement as it played out in Hawaii has really helped us to heal and mend the broken pieces, but there are always ways to envision betterment. And you know, as you're saying this, I'm thinking to myself, who is better positioned to notice that? No pun intended, right? But you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I've learned that my condition gives me many gifts, hmm. and I might not be able to walk, but I don't pine and sigh about that. What I've been given is the ability to literally be still. Mm -hmm. As still as somebody who doesn't have to think about meditating, they just meditate. Wow. As still as the awareness that you're given when, uh, for, any, for instance, you know, if I'm in my wheelchair, I'm picking up those malasadas at Leonard Bakery, Leonard Bakery <laughs> on my way home from UH Manoa in my wheelchair, a typical day, and my buddy Nainoa Thompson taught me enough about wayfinding that I can look up in the sky and I'm not leaving Leonard's. So I'm going to drink my milk and eat my monosalas there if that sky looks like it's going to open up on me and I'm going to get wet going home. Now, that's a very ancient system of knowledge. Yes. Giving me a very contemporary gift. Don't let the kid catch cold. Yeah. Give him enough of the old school to be able to take care of himself in the world. So, you know, no, it's not going from Tahiti to Hawaii, but it might as well be that kind of It's the same thing. Your, your wheelchair is your canoe. Yeah, they, yeah. So, as a native Hawaiian, yeah, as a quadriplegic, mm -hmm. you made it through high school. I did. You went to U University of Hawaii. University of Hawaii. You got your first degree in in, in history. No, I was in psychology Psych in seventy six. Psychology in seventy six. Masters in counseling and guidance in seventy nine. And then you got your goodbye U H. Aloha. I don't need you anymore. Cockshore, American trained rehabilitation counselor, goes back to the hospital where he did his rehab said, hi, I'm back. You guys promised me a job. I got the piece of paper. And I lasted one year. <laughs> and I realized, oh my goodness, I don't want to be a counselor. Now, you know, identity crisis. What the heck do I want to be? Because I was pushing, well, almost pushing 30. And I didn't have career plans set. And I thought, well, you abysmal failure. <laughs> because I set very high expectations for myself and was always the last one to pat myself on the back for a good job. Mm -hmm done a job well done and mm -hmm. and so I found it for a while until I found myself and it wasn't really found it was 10 years of being a, a wheelchair sports bum I, I kept availing myself of the services at UH and the PE department mm -hmm. a professor that gave me my actually my first teaching job at UH Jim Little allowed me to teach for him from 1983 to 86 he went away to Guam I found out teaching not counseling was my end of education when he came back, I went back nine years later from the time I got my master's to go and start a PhD. And you did your PhD in? In Pacific Islands history. And that took seven years. Wow. 88 to 95. At the Center for Hawaiian Studies, Kamakakuo Kalani at uh, University of Hawaii. At Sakamaki Hall in the history department. Before the Center That's for right. Hawaiian Studies was built, huh? Yeah, before yeah, the okay. Center for Hawaiian Studies was built there. And while the fledgling program, Hawaiian Studies, was just getting off the ground. Gotcha. So you came out of PhD, 
your I PhD did. was in, in Hawaiian studies, and then you began to teach as a professor history. at University of Hawaii. Yeah, I came to them Hawaiian studies as a historian. <clears throat> wow. And that was another adjustment because I knew how to teach history. I didn't know what an interdisciplinary area study was from a hole in the head. Mm. So more training, more familiarization with the mentorship and the genius of Honani K. Trask, uh, the, the cultural grounding of Lili Kalakame Elehiva, meeting other people like Mo Moller, Bobby Kanahele, Mili mm -hmm. Lani Trask, so many people along the way. All these people acted as mentors for you, yes? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wow. They're, they're, they're chronological contemporaries. Yes. They're in my generation. But yes. They were eons ahead in terms of political consciousness. Yes. And then people like Dr. Trask to introduce me to the Malcolm X's of the world, mm -hmm. to other struggles, mm -hmm. to Franz Fanon, and to the, the literature on struggle mm -hmm. and on oppression, and to realize that, well, okay, truth be told, I personally don't feel we ever had it as rough as African Americans, mm -hmm. but I understand their pain because of my pain, not my personal pain, but being genealogically connected to my pure Hawaiian grandmother, Susan Kalepa Johnson, who was a teacher like mm -hmm. me, and who never had a chance to actualize her best and her brightest days as a teacher, because mm -hmm. she chose to become a mom of seven. Wow. And my mom is one of her children. Wow. So my mom became that intermediate, intermediary branch bridge teacher. Yes. From grandma to me. Yes. And um, the bridge I, between the generations. Yeah, you know, and I, yes. I started to really use that intelligence uh, quite a ways later than I was given it. I was able to, you might find this hard to believe, but I could speak in complete sentences in 18 months as the family story goes. I do believe it. And I, and I could read before I went to kindergarten. Wow. I started to use it in graduate school. <laughs> okay, this local boy wanted to hang around and be a brother. And so in order to do that real well, first of all, you don't speak what I call talking head English. Yeah. You got to speak pidgin. Yes. And the pidgin culture and the pidgin identity went deep, real deep. Mm -hmm. And it was a big conflict for a long, long time in me. Because mm -hmm. the better you showed yourself meant you, you switch code out of pidgin into talking in English, and I said to myself, switch code my, well, you know, what my was. My okole. Right. My Rear end, yeah. And I, I said for a long time, they ain't changing for nobody. Yeah. So I started doing it as a young Hawaiian studies professor, telling the youth in my class, hey, so what, I get a PhD, and what, if I talk like this, what, they go take them away? <laughs> and it validated not only my identity, I found out, I started saying that, it got old hat and I got tired of saying it, I was saying it for that kid who was like me, the first of the grandchildren in his ohana mm -hmm. to come through the doors of the University of Hawaii at Mono. Wow. You know, and wow. to realize that's the impact we were making. That's the history we were making. Now, did we offend people along the way? You bet. Was most of it justified? I think so. You don't go down to the state legislature and say, pretty please. That's right. To get $6 million to build a permanent site that's right. for a Hawaiian presence on that campus. Mm -hmm. And I was proud to be part of that, but I don't think I can stay in that intense arena and be a Kelly e. Collier today and be a Keala Kelly today and pick up the resistance that needs to be picked up against things like the University Area Research Center and the Striker Brigades and all of the frontline stuff I, I will do in spirit. Yes. Because these are people I've worked with and some people have studied with us and we're proud that our students are carrying that torch. But I need to realize that there's something baby boomers all need to realize. Wherever they are in the world, it's not going to last forever. Mm -hmm. Your own mortality catches up with you. Be as productive as you can, but don't deny what is natural, which means we all someday will die. Ah, oh, wow. What a, great, what a great message and lesson. You obviously have touched and motivated a lot of people. A lot of the people you named are now frontline workers, or I should say volunteers, movers and shakers in the resistance movement uh, to create a better future for Hawaii. Uh, I want to go back, though, to a, much earlier in your life, Kanalo, if we can, for a second. And I want to 
find out from you what was the time or what was the event or what occurred that actually was the switch that flipped, that turned you into that person who you said, you know what, I'm a fighter. I'm going to do everything I can. Nothing is going to hold me back. And I'm going to make stuff happen. When was that? Wow. I'd have to say after the accident at the Rehabilitation Hospital of the Pacific and one day, I believe it was a weekend in 1969, November or December, there's this gnat or this maybe small fly or some kind of flying insect that landed up on my cheek. And I hadn't moved a muscle, literally, since August 14th and the accident. I had left Queens in October, and that weekend in my bed at rehab, some connection between the frustration of that itch and tickle on my face, and something that was ready to move, that hadn't moved, like I say, for months, got me to bring my hand up to my face, mm. to swat the itch on, on my own. And it was like this, and the thing flew away, but I didn't know how to retrace the route of my nerves to say, bring it down to your side. <laughs> so I was going, nurse, nurse, because I couldn't hit a call bell. My voice was my call bell. And when they put the hand down to the side, my hand down to my side, I laid back. And I felt like I had just ridden a wave again. Wow. Because in those months, what I missed was playing my ukulele and surfing. Mm. Teenager excitement. And not having the surfing and the ukulele play got temporarily replaced by hitting and swatting at that bug myself. Because mm. that was the shred of humanity I had left to build upon. You never know about a hospital life until you, you live it. And then pretty soon, empathy for other patients. Mm -hmm. A plantation worker, 80 years old in 1969, who breaks her hip reaching for a bag of rice? Mm. Come on, how fair is that? Yeah. And here I am, knowing I'm going to grow up with this disability and never walk the rest of my life, but I'm supposed to get in line in front of that lady in the pity party? No way. So it teaches you, life experience teaches you great lessons if and stop and give it a chance. So you, you came out of the hospital, you were able to start to move again, yeah. went through high school, went through college, got your doctorate, now you're a professor at University of Hawaii mm -hmm. Center for Hawaiian Studies, and now that you're in bed at home here, mm -hmm. what you were telling me was the world is now coming through your door to you. Tell us about some of the people that have visited you recently, because they wanted to meet you well struck up a, a very nice friendship with uh, the wife of the ex-president of the University of Hawaii hmm. Mrs. Kit Dobell she has vast experience um, to her own life and professional self like her husband served in President Jimmy Carter's administration I met the woman who asked the important questions for 40 years in press conferences in the Oval Office of the President of the United States. This is somebody who came right in this room right, right. to meet with you here in your office right here in bed. Yeah. 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 I met a gentleman from Israel who found a way to dig deep enough in the deserts of the Middle East to bring water to a place that heretofore had not been used to grow crops. Wow. I have been very, very blessed to meet all kinds of people because people here in Hawaii who know my situation and consider it something that they want to do to come and visit and just talk story. That's all it is. You're just talking story. Is really, I think, internationalizing the spirit of talk story for building bridges for human understanding. 
Wow. And again, we never start out with knowing the entire Tuleana. Much of it unfolds and is revealed to us as we live it. Yes, very good. You know, a lot of our viewers are watching and, you know, they're saying, wow, this guy is a phenomenal person. And what would you, but they may say, you know, he's exceptional and I'm just me. What message would you have for our viewers watching the show right now who may be sitting there saying, well, yeah, he's, he's really exceptional, but I, I really couldn't, I couldn't do that. Well, I guess the first thing I'd say is, there are exceptional qualities in every so-called ordinary human being. Mm -hmm. Find what your exceptional qualities are, and they are usually connected with your passions. And have the courage to live your passions fully, even if that seems outlandish. Mm. Even if that seems against the grain, and especially if that seems out of character for you. <laughs> because that's the new field that we can till. That's the ano ano, the seed that can be planted when you take the spear out of your hands for most days and, and put an o-o digging stick there. Mm. Plant the seeds with the o-o. The spear, you know where to get it if you need it, but we usually don't need it. Mm -hmm. That's great. Canelo, we have just a couple of minutes left. I wanted to ask you, how do you see the future of Hawaii? If you had a magic wand and you could create the future of Hawaii any way you wanted it, what would that look like? Well, with all due respect to the United States of America, I'd love to see the United States of America as the country, Hawaii's staunchest ally. I'd like to see America share us with the world by allowing us to be a country. To be independent. Yes, I'd like to see a deoccupation of the Hawaiian Islands by the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. And as long as there's enough magic wand to go around, I think then our national agenda as a country will allow for the environmental affairs and the population control to be under stringent national laws that will preserve Hawaii not for just ourselves, again, kuleana to preserve Hawaii for the world and teach the world how to sustain life, wow. not destroy it. Wow, what an awesome answer and what a great way to end it right there. I have to end by telling you something. You are Hawaii's Superman. You are. Thank you so much for being with us on Voices of Truth. It's been a privilege and an honor to be with you here today. To with you, you are an inspiration to me. To our viewers, thank you so much for being here with this very special edition of Voices of Truth, one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's Future, brought to you by the Kiwani Foundation. I'm Ehuke Kahu Cardwell. Until next time, ahui ho.